Now, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first rising star presenter, Dr. Shua Chung. Dr. Chung received a PhD in biomedical engineering from the Tsinghua University School of Medicine, specializing in model development for fMRI and combined functional PET fMRI. Dr. Chung is an exceptional postdoctoral neuroimaging engineer scientist in our Stanford Center for Precision Mental Health and Wellness. She's dedicated to advancing neuroimaging and computational approaches within the context of precision psychiatry. Her research is centering on innovative methods for complex mechanistic trials for novel therapeutics, particularly the personalized imaging of ketamine, MDMA and psilocybin. And these she wants us to make available to inform clinical decisions. She'll present on this work today. Let me take the opportunity to also congratulate Dr. Chung on her Nature of Communications paper on her ketamine findings published this week, together with co lead Laura Hack. Join me in welcoming Dr. Chung to the stage. Thank you for your kind introduction, Dr. Williams. And it is my greatest honor to speak at the third annual Precision Mental Health and Wellness Symposium to delve into the world of personalized psychiatry, personalized neuroscience, and how we use such innovative fields to shape the future of mental health treatments as a biomedical engineer. Today, my talk, as Dr. Williams mentioned, is gonna be personalized imaging with novel therapeutics. And I, I'm gonna zoom in to focus on MDMA, a novel therapeutic that has drew attention from both our scientific community, but also the general audience. And I will show you how we can use a connectome approach to understand the mechanisms of MDMA and try to answer the question of who we should deliver this treatment to. So as you heard from Dr. Rodriguez, MDMA, the 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine is a synthetic compound. Um, you may often hear the um, string names, Molly or Ascotercy. Taking MDMA will induce a characteristic feeling of emotional connectedness, openness, or empathy and trust. And just as Dr. Rodriguez pointed out, Recently, um, the research has shown promise for using MDMA combined with psychotherapy to treat PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And just a few weeks ago, actually the second phase three trial using MDMA combined with psychotherapy has replicated their first trial, indicating there's a greater um, treatment outcome as compared to placebo combined with psychotherapy. However, if you look at the response rate, despite using a very intensive multi-session treatment, there are still people who did not respond as indicated by the gray bar here. So it definitely suggests MDMA is a promising therapeutic. However, it is not a universal cure for everyone. So despite we know it is not a general cure for everyone, you often hear about headlines highlighting how prom promising using MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. And in fact, Australia has just approved the use of MDMA in treating PTSD. It definitely suggests there's a desperate need for a cure for psychiatric disorders, but it also suggests our research is behind the expectation and very likely an inflated expectation so to keep up with this expectation, one way is to pursue mechanistic study because it can shed light on the biological underpins and the psychotherapeutic processes that's responsible for the therapeutic effects of MDMA. And by including your imaging, we will be specifically be able to answer what is the neural mechanism and who we should deliver this treatment to. 
there are a few seminar studies using your imaging to try to understand the neural mechanism of MDMA. And in those studies, they have focused on regions or networks. And here, just motivated by those research, I focus on a method that combines the whole brain data-driven parcellation with a seven network scheme. Here, the data-driven whole brain parcellation has 246 regions. And the seven network, as you can see, have this seven network scheme. So if we combine them, we can get seven cortical networks. They are the deformal network, which relates to self-related thoughts, the dorsal and attention, dorsal and ventral attention network, which relates to attention processing, the frontal parietal network, which is related to the um, cognitive control, et cetera, the cortical limbic network, which regulates emotion, the somatomotor network, which processes sensory and motor information, and the visual network. So you may notice actually those networks only cover the cortex without any with no coverage in the subcortex. Because of that, we added a few regions in the subcortical areas, including hippocampus, amygdala, stratum, and thalamus. And just as I mentioned before, they, there have been similar neuroimaging studies in this field and their results have shown changed functional connectivity in amygdala, in hippocampus, as well as in thalamus. So it confirms that the necessity of including those subcortical regions because now we are able to map the important subcortical to cortical pathways. And, our, and it's very understandable because of different purposes of different projects, those studies have either focused on a seed to whole brain functional connectivity or a seed to establish network functional connectivity. Our approach of focusing on the whole brain connectum will be able to complement the existing findings. So we conducted a mechanistic trial here at Stanford called Stanford R Brain Study. And it is a double blinded crossover design we, we recruited 17 healthy participants and they came for four times to complete a baseline scan and three drug visits, which the order of the drug visits are randomized. At each of the, um, so after baseline, they came for a placebo, an 80 milligram MDMA and a 120 milligram MDMA. I do want to note, this is not a therapeutic study. This is a mechanistic study. So no counseling was provided, but our study personnel had tried their best to constantly check in with our participants to make sure they felt comfortable. During each of the data collecting session, we collected multi-dimensional information, including your imaging data, and specifically here, it is the functional magnetic resonance imaging data, fMRI data. We also collected behavior data, software reports, as well as clinician administered questionnaires. And here for my talk, I will only focus on the task-free resting state data, during which participants were asked to focus on a course that's shown in the middle of the screen and let their mind wander as it usually does. So we scanned our participants actually during the drug, the peak drug effects. And the question was whether they felt comfortable lying there, right, under the effect of MDMA. And surprisingly, according to multiple participants, they reported being a secure cocoon or womb. Additionally, we also assessed yeah, that was quite surprising. Um, additionally, we also assessed the altered states of openness and trust, which are thought to be related to the therapeutic effect of MDMA. So we used a visual analog skill um, with zero representing not at all and 100 representing extreme. We also used the five dimensional altered states of, uh, of consciousness questionnaire 
So here I'm showing you only four examples from the view analog skill and the alter state of consciousness questionnaire. As you can see, for both the 80 milligram and the 120 milligram, there's a significant increase in wanting to be with others, trusting, bliss, and insightfulness. And this is consistent with their self-report of wanting to connect with others and reduce the level of defensiveness. So what about, how do we actually uh, measure the brain from the neuroimaging, right? When we here, we actually included two metrics. The first one is the functional connectivity. It is a Pearson correlation between the time series from two regions. So it measures the communication between two regions. Here, because we have this region-wise parcelation and we have the seven network scheme, so we are able to provide both region-to-region -region functional connectivity as well as network-to-network -network functional connectivity. Here, I'm showing you the uh, functional connectivity or connectum in this circular ring object. So the segment of the dial of this ring represents different regions or different networks and the line linking those regions or networks represents the functional connectivity between them. Additionally, we also measure the activity measure from our neuroimaging data and we quantified the amplitude of low frequency fluctuation of it measures the uh, amplitude of signal between 0.01 to 0.09 hertz. And we do the same for each voxel, each brain, and each condition. By having these two measures, we are able to provide information for the activity of each region, but as well as the functional connectivity, the functional communication between different regions or networks. Here I'm showing you the results from a functional connectivity analysis, and I'm summarizing all the results at network level, as you can tell from the labels here. Here, those red ribbons represent increased functional connectivity under both the 80 milligram and 120 milligram, while the blue represents decreased functional connectivity in both 80 milligram and 120 milligram. So you probably already can tell from this graph that there's a global increase in the functional connectivity and it spans across multiple networks and actually every network. And here I'm showing you the average of increase on the left side of the screen. The only exception is the decrease of functional connectivity within the subcortical regions. And similarly, I'm showing you the decrease on the right side of the screen. So we have seen increased global, globally, um, globally increased functional connectivity across multi-networks. And we see the localized decreased functional connectivity within subcortex. The question becomes whether those changes in functional connectivity are associated with the feeling of increased openness and trust. Indeed, we have observed a sig significant correlation between the functional connectivity increase and the increased level of wanting to be with others, trusting, bliss, and insightfulness. And similarly, we see a correlation between the decreased localized functional connectivity with this increased level of openness and trust, despite the correlation is negative. And I've mentioned the increase of functional connectivity is global, but we're still curious which network or which regions are mostly affected. And they are the deformal network, the somatomotor net network, and the dorsal attention network. You will see in a minute. So at possible condition, these three networks do not interact a lot. As you can tell, by the decoupling of the time series shown at the bottom. Their functional connectivity increased at 80 minigram, as you can tell from the coupling of the time series on the bottom. 
and their functional connectivity increased uh, even more at the 120 milligram, as shown by the most coupling of the time series. So what about the decrease, right? It is within the subcortex, but which region? It is the intrathalamic functional connectivity. At possible condition, you can see those subnucleus within thalamus are highly correlated with each other as represented by the time series. And this coupling is decreased at 80 minigram as represented by the decoupling from the time series. And so even further decreased at 120 minigram represented by the least coupling of the time series. And if you actually look at the time series at 120 minigram, you may probably notice there seems to be a little bit more higher frequency fluctuations as compared to possible and 80 milligram. So the question becomes whether we will be able to capture that using our activity analysis. The answer is yes. We did notice there is a decrease in activity of thalamus at 80 milligram. And, this eight, and it is similarly for 120 milligram. Here I'm showing you the average from both uh, the left side of thalamus and the right side of thalamus. Okay, thalamus is important and the activity decreased, but where specifically in thalamus, right? If we zoom in and show the coronal view of our finding, we will be able to compare it with the Allen Human Brain Atlas defined thalamus nucleus. And here we observed a 70% overlap with our finding and the medial dorsal thalamus. This is surprising because we all know fMRI doesn't have the best resolution to image the subnucleus of thalamus. And we all know that fMRI including um, the preprocessing that has smoothing as one step. Additionally, we also see decreased activity in the cortical regions that thalamus projects to including regions in the deformal network, as well as, as well as the frontal parietal network. And similarly, we see this decreased activity in the medial dorsal thalamus is associated with increased level of wanting to be with others, trusting, bliss, and insightfulness. So how do we actually reconcile our findings, right? We see global increase in functional connectivity. We see decreased activity in thalamus. We all know that thalamus is a very important relay station. It receives, it receives um, sensory information from different parts of our body and it filters the information and then only transfer a subset of information to the cortex for further processing. It also receives information from the cortex and for the medial dorsal thalamus specifically, we are talking about it projects to the prefrontal cortex and then also affects other brain areas as well. So one straightforward hypothesis might be because the deactivity of thalamus, there are more information that goes through thalamus to the cortex, which then reduce, which then induce the increase of global functional connectivity. It is actually a hypothesis that's been proposed for the classic psychedelics, including psilocybin and LSD. Here we have the opportunity to partially test it for our MDMA. What we did is we looked at the deactivity or decreased activity of uh, medial dorsal thalamus with its, um, and look at its association with the increased global functional connectivity. Indeed, as we observe from this plot, there is a pot, there's a negative correlation between them two, indicating the lower the thalamus activity is, the higher the global functional connectivity will be. Another way to try to understand our results better is to look at the spatial distribution of our finding. So if we quantify how much each region's functional connectivity is affected by MDMA, we can map them back to the brain. So here shows the map of uh, how each region's functional connectivity is affected. 
we can then compare this map to the off change map, the activity change map. They actually show a, a weak but significant correlation, possibly indicating they have shared but also complementary information. Another way to try to understand our results is based on the current neurotransmitter hypothesis for MDMA, including serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Here indeed, we see a positive correlation between our finding and the spatial distribution of serotonin 1A and uh, 2, 2A receptors. On the other hand, we also see a negative correlation between our finding and the norepinephrine as well as the serotonin 1B receptor distributions. And here I'm summarizing more um, the association between our finding with multiple neurotransmitter systems. Here red and the yellow indicates uh, positive correlation, while blue indicates negative correlation. Just based on this result, it seems uh, the results or the neural profile um, induced by MDMA is not via a single neurotransmitter system. It is actually via several neurotransmitter systems. So we know, okay, um, activity of thalamus is important, global increase in functional connectivity, but how do we actually make use of such information to pre-select people that we think will mostly benefit from MDMA? Because of the important role of thalamus, we are curious whether we can use the baseline thalamus activity to differentiate people and whether this differentiation will be able to predict their neural profiles under MDMA. Here we use the median split to group our participants into high activity versus low activity group. As you can tell from the plot, these two groups differ on their thalamus activity at baseline. So we then ask the question whether these two groups differ on their neural profile induced by MDMA. And indeed, we have seen for the high activity group, their global increase of functional connectivity is much higher as compared to the low activity group. You already see from the previous slide that the increase in global functional connectivity is associated with increased level of openness and trust which are thought to be related to the therapeutic effects of MDMA. So here, this result might suggest this high activity group might be a better target for, um, for the treatment of MDMA. Just to summarize, here we use the connectome approach to uh, look at the effect of MDMA in the brain. What we found is a global increase in functional connectivity while we localized the decrease in functional connectivity. We also noticed that there is a decreased activity in thalamus region, as well as decreased activity in the regions that thalamus projects to. We showed that this neural profile is associated with the increased level of openness and trust. We also showed that this profile is associated with multiple neurotransmitter systems. In addition, we also showed early um, evidence that we may use this marker of um, baseline thalamus activity to try to select people who might benefit the most from MDMA. Um, I want to use the time to invite you to drop by to our poster 23. Uh, this is a project also from the same MDMA study, but instead of resting state, here we're using an analogous stress task, which is actually a social emotion task. We also try to use the baseline activation in response to this social emotion task to differentiate people and then try to predict their neural profile under MDMA. Uh, I highly well, I invite you to visit this poster and talk to our wonderful clinical coordinator, Claire Bertrand. She, um, she will be able to tell you more about the nuances in this study. I also invite you to drop by our poster number 25. This is the results from the sister study focusing on ketamine. 
and we focused on actually the side effect of ketamine, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned before, the dissociation. We're trying to look at how different subcomponents of dissociation actually contributes to how the brain in re, uh, how the brain activity in response to social threat. And just as uh, Dr. Williams mentioned before, this work just was uh, published on Nature Communications. At last and not least, I would like to thank all the study personnel involved in this complicated trial, um, the funding resources, as well as maps for providing the drug, and a very special thanks to our participants for participating in such a complicated and intensive study. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for a wonder wonderful presentation. We have time for a couple of questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks for the fantastic talk. So for identifying these individuals that would respond well to MDMA-assisted therapy, do you see some advantage in observing the fine-grained parcellation with almost 300 parcels over these seven subnetworks? Right. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, so um, this method remains, you know, the resolution of the region level, but also has the network level information, right? So uh, because of having this, we are able to capture the effect from, you know, thalamus region, but also we'll be able to capture the effect of the network level. As you see from the slides, we know deformal network is mostly affected. We know um, somatomotor networks mostly affected. And why we are so interested in which networks mostly, um, mostly affected is because we then can map back to the neurotransmitter systems. And indeed, because of those information we get from the network, the parcellation, we are able to you know, make a conclusion of what I just presented. That, does that answer your question? Um, yes, definitely, yes. Um, 